Welcome to the first video of deep learning for audio classification in Python. Uh, this video tutorial series is primarily meant for anyone who wants to get started doing some machine learning on audio data. Uh, the way we're going to go about this is I'll provide you guys with an example audio data set and um, we'll be trying to create some machine learning models so that are going to be able to classify uh, these 10 different musical instruments within our data set. So um, some prerequisite knowledge that's good to have is uh, hopefully you, you've done some machine learning in Python before, um, but specifically we'll be working with um, convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks. Um, but this first video is going to be pretty much going over all theory. It's not going to be any code written in this first video. And we're going to be going over some digital signal processing techniques uh, to use to pre-process our audio data. Because it turns out if we do a good job pre-processing our audio, it makes it very easy for machine learning to tell the difference between um, our different instruments, okay? So uh, the first thing we need to address is what does our data look like? Um, so when you record data from a sensor, um, every sensor has something called a bit depth. And uh, in our case of so the microphone, this microphone is a bit depth of 16. So that means that when we look at the signal in the time domain, uh, it can take on two to the 16 different integer values, all right? Um, but another thing is that if we just look at a signal in the time domain, it's very difficult to tell what this is. We wouldn't really know if it's a saxophone. So one way to express the data in another format is doing something called uh, the Fourier transform. And the way we actually kind of do that transformation was use, we use something called the fast Fourier transform. And this will construct uh, this plot over here, which is called a periodogram. And we're taking the real value of the Fourier transform, which is what you see here. And it goes all the way up to this, this high frequency of uh, right around 22 uh, kilohertz. And uh, why 22 kilohertz? Well, um, audio is typically recorded at a rate of 44.1 kilohertz. And this will leave us with something called a Nyquist frequency, which is exactly half of that sampling frequency, which is what you'll see here. So the Nyquist frequency is the highest frequency that we can represent uh, from our environment. So let's say, okay, we're sampling audio at 44.1 kilohertz, and there's some kind of 30 kilohertz kilohertz sound occurring in the environment, our microphone's not going to be able to pick up on it because um, it can only accurately represent a signal that uh, on the high end, the highest frequency it can represent is uh, 22 kilohertz, okay? Uh, which is fine because, and what you'll notice is when you look at this periodogram, most of the content, the magnitude, so what this actually is, it's a, it's called a power uh, spectral density estimate uh, for all these different frequency bands, okay? Um, and it turns out that usually with speech and most audio, um, most changes happening at low frequencies. So one pre-processing step we can do uh, is we can downsample our audio. So it's very common to like downsample. Um, in this case, I'll be downsampling to 16 kilohertz and that'll give us a Nyquist frequency of right around 8,000. So um, that's quite useful because that's right where the data starts to become irrelevant after that point. So uh, that's just kind of the basics of Fourier transform. Hopefully you guys already knew that, but it's going to be the backbone for everything we're going to do from here on out. So with that in mind, let's talk about the spectrogram. Uh, a spectrogram is really just taking periodograms and you're stacking them adjacent to each other over time. So if we take a look at uh, this one second of time domain, uh, we're going to create periodograms. So every tenth of a second, we're going to create four periodograms, and then we're going to stack them next to each other, and that's what we're seeing here. So uh, we still have frequency in the y-axis. I'm only showing you like the first 2,000. And now instead of magnitude on the x-axis, we have time. So uh, we can watch the signal change over time, and that magnitude becomes these pixel intensities when we represent it as an image, um, as like these uh, spectral bands. So if you go back here, we saw we have one here, one here, a lot of, a lot of like high magnitudes in these specific frequencies, that's what you see here. They're being represented um, by this spectrogram. So uh, the next thing we get to talk about, uh, this is probably, it's used very widely for a lot of audio. Uh, it's called a short time Fourier transform. So it's not enough to just stack our periodograms right next to each other. Um, there's a, a method called the short time Fourier transform where 
Uh, the idea behind it is uh, audio changes continuously all the time, but what if we were to take just a small um, moment in time of the audio and we'll assume that it's it's stationary. That's kind of the whole idea behind this is that uh, let's just walk through this example. So say we're sampling at 16 kilohertz and we've got this time series signal. What we're going to do is uh, we'll have a window which the convention is to have a window every uh, of a length of 25 milliseconds and then we'll have a step size uh, so we'll step this window forward um, at a rate of 10 milliseconds. So uh, we'll kind of take this window size and then we'll step it over to compute our actual periodogram. Um, now, uh, the 25 millisecond, the 10 millisecond step is standard. You can change it, but typically almost everyone does it this way. And the idea is that, well, we want to we want a window size that is um, small enough, um, but it also has to be we want it to be small, but it needs to be big enough so that we get enough um, power spectral estimate within that window. So um, typically, and when we compute the FFT, I should note that the the sizes are based on powers of two. So when it actually computes it, it's going to give you, it's going to compute on like, for this example, 512 samples. So it's going to take this 400 sample window, and then it's going to add 112 zeros onto it when it does the FFT. Um, and the, the other thing to mention is when we have our window, uh, there's this other thing, you can see this distribution. Uh, it kind of just looks like a, a bell curve. Uh, this is this is called a Hanning window, and you can use. There's lots of different types of windows. They're very similar, but generally you use a Hanning window when you compute the FFT. And the reason for that is to actually reduce something called uh, spectral leakage. Uh, you can just Google image search that if you don't know what that is. But that's the idea behind this um, the Hanning window. We introduce it. So uh, and the result. So what's the whole point of like stacking these really small frames of of data and then putting them next to each other. Well, when we take a look at it and some of these plots, uh, you'll notice that you can start to see contours. Um, because the windows overlap with, with previous versions of themselves, uh, you get these really nice, you get to watch the signal change, how its power changes into different frequency bands over time. Um, and the idea is it just creates a really nice um, contours in your audio signal or your image of the audio. Uh, so at this point, you can use the short time, like you could throw this into a, an algorithm, but there's a little bit more we can do to make classification more robust. So um, sometimes the short time Fourier transform is like a hop off point for different types of audio modeling that you want to do, but we can go a little bit further for classification. That's what we'll talk about next. I move myself back over. Okay, so um, now we're going to talk about the MEL scale. So the theory behind the MEL scale is that as humans, it's very easy for us to tell the difference between low frequency values. So like uh, the difference between 10 and 100 hertz is very obvious and pretty much everyone would know which one's higher, which one's lower. However, once we get, um, you know, higher frequency amounts like 15,000 hertz, well, that, that's quite a lot. And if 100 hertz difference when you're already up to the 15, uh, thousand humans can't tell the difference between them. they probably sound almost identical to us um, so one way to and the idea behind the mel scale is that you're you want to transform those those linear frequencies into uh, we, we actually do like a log transform so if you see there's a natural log on these linear frequencies um, you get a graph like this and the idea behind it is we don't really care about the difference between large frequencies but we do really care about all the little discrete things that happen at low frequencies. So what we're doing is we rebin our, our frequency content to make it more um, accurately represent what a human might consider important in an audio signal. And the way we do this, so we create a filter bank. Um, and the standard is we create 26 filters. Now the spacing between them, actually it will start to space based on the MEL scale. So um, you get these 26 uh, triangular filters to bin your energies into. And the way to think about this, if we go back to the periodogram, now imagine if you were to put a triangular filter over this and you, you would keep this peak, but then everything else would get lost. And so now you're, you're actually building features um, based on the power spectral density. 
And that's the idea behind the filter banks. So you'll construct all these filter banks and these will start to create features for your machine learning that are gonna be more relevant to um, the actual calculations you're gonna be doing. Uh, so uh, typically the, the filter bank coefficients are log scale and this is what they'll now end up looking like. Uh, so another thing that happens here, because we're using, one, we're using triangular filters that overlap, and we're also doing the short time Fourier transform, which has signals that inherently overlap during our calculation. Uh, what we're left with, with the filter bank energies, is we're left with lots of values that are highly correlated. So the dimensions of these filter banks, because we use, if we use 26 filters, this is a 26, and then um, for a one second of data, it works out that this rounded down to 99, but usually um, it should be right around like 100, 100, like a, I guess a, a 26 by 100 matrix. Um, so there's one last step. In order to decorrelate a lot of these energies, we can do something called the discrete cosine transform. Um, it's kind of, the way you can think of the discrete cosine transform is it's used a lot in uh, audio compression and image compression and you can almost think of it as a, a low pass filter for your um, different energies you've already calculated so the idea is that we're trying to remove high frequency content we compact it all the information down to lower frequencies and that's what you'll see here so uh, this is actually what creates uh, our final feature which will be called the mel frequency septal coefficient so we do the discrete cosine transform on our our filter bank energies and we get uh, this, what you would get actually is a, 20, a 26 by 99. But what we do, because we're compacting it, and we're saying, well, lower frequencies matter a lot. And we'll, we can see this in the next video when we start like programming this actually and making some function calls. I'll show you guys why uh, it doesn't really add much to have more additional uh, like MFCCs added on. So what we do is we take 13, we take half of them and we discard them. So now we're only keeping that the low frequency and it, they all end up looking like kind of like a unique fingerprint. So if we if we look at this from the original, like the time series, they look very different. Like you could probably sit down and you'd be able to quickly memorize which is which. And I bet you could tell the difference between all 10 of these. Um, and that's really what we're going for. We're trying to get rid of this temporal response that you see with the filter bank energies. Like, you see the acoustic guitar dies out. It looks pretty consistent. There, there are some changes, and there's, there's a way to calculate the delta of how your MSCCs change. Um, but I didn't have much success, and I, I guess we'll talk about that when we move on to the next portion. But um, that's pretty much it. Once you create the melt frequency septal coefficients, um, it gives us a really consistent image over time of what our signal is. And if we were to run some algorithms on it, it's gonna do a, a much better job than if we had just given it like the short time Fourier transform or something like that. All right, so uh, to wrap up, I'm gonna mention a, three resources here that you might wanna read. Uh, the first one is Practical Cryptography. Uh, it's a, game, a guy's blog named um, James, James Lyons. Let me see if I can pull this up. So he actually made a, uh, I guess you'd call it, his own library for doing uh, speech analysis for like, mainly he was talking about it from like automatic speech recognition, but uh, I did use his library. You can also use Labrosa, but if you go over to his blog, I would really recommend everything I just talked about is written up to some fashion in here. So uh, it's a good blog post and you can read through it and it'll give you the, basically everything we talked about here, but you might wanna give it a couple reads to make sure you understand this stuff. Uh, the next thing I would recommend this blog, he did a pretty good job, but he actually has some Python code here breaking down all of this. Now, again, we're going to do this in the next, uh, the next video. So, uh, but if you want kind of like another explanation with some, some pretty good, I thought this was a pretty good blog. So definitely check it out. And the last one I would recommend is this kind of post on the discrete cosine transform it talks a little bit about like, okay, well, what is the discrete cosine transform? How is it used in like image compression? What are we really doing to the image? Uh, it's a good thing to just go over uh, to make sure that you understand that. Um, but with that in mind, um, the next video, I'll probably have like a Google Drive link where I'll keep all this stuff and then we'll get started with actually um, doing some pre-processing on the audio. So I uh, hope to see you there.